This is the story of a podcast, how we are overwhelmed by the complexities of modern life, and how everyone came to believe that autism was a form of superpower. In Brooklyn, New York and Cincinnati, Ohio in 2016, three men set out to create a new technological fantasy. They called themselves Chapo Grey Wolves, and what they set out to do was create a new form of politics that would blend the Dadaist comedic absurdity of weird Twitter with the ideas of Islamist thinker Saeed Qutb through the medium of podcasting. But while the out-of-touch politicians slept, a powerful new ideology was beginning to form. One in which irony was good, where family court was bad, and whose leaders promised triple-digit orgasms and a renewable fuel source and miracle cure in the form of the sugar substitute stevia. But a strange thing happened after these men began to pretend to hate sex and masturbation. The more they joked about it, the more the young technocrats realized that being voluntarily celibate was in fact not a joke. Their aim was to create a new world, one which pitted those voluntarily celibate against those who had no choice in their own abstinence. But what the politicians didn't realize was that they had ceded control to a dark and dangerously simplified version of humanity in which people could be classified and their futures determined simply by whether they were capable of having sex. Turkey, President Erdogan had a different vision, one in which he could use this strange new utopia to get revenge on his former colleague turned rival. That was uh, my little tribute to Adam Curtis uh, to open up this new show. Adam Curtis, whose new movie, Hyper Normalization, came out this week, and I watched it all instantly. If you know Adam Curtis, please ask him to come on the show. This is Chapo. Let's go. Hey, it's me again, your boy Will Menneker here. Um, we got a great interview for this week. It's a long one. We're talking to Jeremy Scahill, and we take a long, deep dive into the nation of Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and the uh, abyss of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, just quick note about this interview. It is just myself and Felix talking to Jeremy this week. Unfortunately, no Matt. He had to be called away. Um, the treats were calling him and we couldn't get him this week, but he is still with us in spirit and we'll be back soon. Oh, and, uh, also real quick, uh, shout out to Chris Person for contributing some of the writing to that Adam Curtis cold open. Let's roll that interview with Jeremy Scahill. Cheers. (laughs) We're here with, uh, Jeremy Scahill of The Intercept. How's it going? It's great to be here in the house. (laughs) <laughs> it is indeed a house. When I told, I was telling, I was telling the, some of the people at First Look who are like in charge of trying to create podcasts. They were like asking me what podcasts I, I listen to, and I actually don't really listen to that many podcasts. But I mentioned your podcast, and their lo- the look on their faces was like sour, and they but they thought I was like messing with them, like it was like a <laughs> Chapo Guzman's podcast. <laughs> it's not a very NPR vibe. I'm gonna but. we're gonna use that as a blurb uh, when we launch the website. That's an interesting podcast, <laughs> The Intercept. No, no, not The Intercept. Okay. Like the Intercept. 
Intercept is cool. There's, you have fans there. It, it, uh, the blurb is our, it plays. Uh, people are talking on it. <laughs> it's on iTunes. Well, the fr- I mean, the thing with when First Link, First Things, First Links, when First Things. <laughs> they like us too. Yeah, they're but, huge fans. But what's ama- amazing to me is that, you know, First Things, I, I wrote about First Things back when I uh, wrote the book on Blackwater. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, because, yeah. Because, you know, I'm, I mean, just like I'm sure everybody that listens to, to the show knows the story, but First Things is this like really radical right wing Christian supremacist rag that's been around for a very long time. And they 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 had they launched this really amazing attack on well on you guys. Uh that was like you, you could not have written a better satire of first things. It's like, listen, Youngs, don't listen to these dangerous people. <laughs> they uh they repurposed the article that they wrote about Louis Louis in <laughs> yeah. the 1960s. First things they like I I wrote about them because in the 90s, when um, you know that radical revolutionary Bill Clinton was president, uh, the the it, it kind of coincided with the rise of what we now refer to as like the radical religious right or the, you know sure. the Republican Revolution with Newt Gingrich on like marriage number 14 and, and everything was like the Speaker of the House. Um, but there was this the, part of the way that they got that the Republicans got the evangelical Christians into their camp is that they realized it was a huge voting block of people that traditionally weren't voting. Um, and so they they basically manipulated uh, their own agenda to fit into uh, the evangelical conservative way of looking at the world. And so they made all these concessions to them on issues like uh, you know abortion, mainly on social issues, and really pumped this idea that Clinton had you know implemented a sectar- a, a secular dictatorship. And so in in an issue of First Things um, magazine. They had a forum where they were sort of discussing how to deal with the dark era that they were in of Clinton's secularism, and they actually sort of opened themselves to the question of should we should there be a revolution against Clinton to like overthrow this secular regime? <laughs> I mean, it's really I mean I know we're going to talk about Yemen, but it's like these these guys kind of know you know civil war stuff and like proxy wars and everything. Um, and and so when I saw them the attack about you guys, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Chapel Trap House is connected to Eric Prince, who's good friends with the people that ran first things that. Con- contemplated a revolution the last time a Clinton was in power. The Wait. last thing we want to do is to upset the Ayatollah Council of America. <laughs> I was like previously on good terms with him. Uh, What's kind of amazing about Trump is that like usually the, you know, Max Blumenthal wrote this book, uh, Republican Gomorrah, years ago. And the thesis of that book was sort of, was basically that the, the that religion has been used by like these vile, immoral individuals to sort of like hit a reset button on, on life. It's like, oh, fucking a, you know, 19 year old dude in a car when you're on meth and you're a senator. No problem. Just say you found Jesus. And it's like, it's erased and you're back again. I mean, that's how people like Newt Gingrich and Ann Coulter, who like when they talk about family values, it really is insane because they've had multiple families and um, and they clearly don't value them. And so, you know, you have this situation where Donald Trump clearly has not even read the Bible. You know, he was Corinthians. But he's yeah. like, a, he's like, he's like all ah, you gotta know. This, this is my favorite. Ah, right, this yeah, right here. Right. Why? Like, Number, kisses the Number, Bible. Numbers is a great book. Great book. <laughs> Love it. Perfect. Joe Perfect. was a loser. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. Um, no, but but he, but that, that magic pill hasn't worked for him. Like, he couldn't just, like, the fine Christ thing really didn't work for but, him. But wait, it doesn't need to work for him because I thought, like, tons of evangelicals are supporting him anyway. Like, well, look, I mean, look at this thing that's going on at, uh, at Liberty University. You know, where all these oh, right, students, where they spiked all these it on are like, yeah. yeah, and like that is that's like creepo central. Like the, that, those are like the most warped, fucked up, scary <laughs> young people in America. And even they are like, no, Trump is the devil and the antichrist. But we like, th- doesn't didn't Trump like in terms of the Republican Gomorrah and vis a vis at least the the evangelical base, like who up until you know what, like the starting around the seventies and eighties were largely apolitical. I mean, ha- hasn't it all just given the lie? Like, hasn't he made the sort of Republican establishment realize how little these people actually care about like Burkean conservatism or like small government or things like that? Like they just want that kind of resentment, like just shoveled right. into the coal fire. The sort of make work bow tie institutes of the conservative welfare apparatus. It's kind of like, uh, their time, in the sun, uh, from like, you know, the, early 90s until I guess now was it was like Philip Green and Casino where they're like uh, they, th- they thought they got all that money because they were so fucking smart <laughs> yeah, and yeah. you know they thought that they were selling all these voters on Austrian economics and <laughs> all this shit and you see the same thing with the evangelicals uh, John Dolan had once said this thing that 
evangelicals don't really believe in God, but they worship God as America. <laughs> and Trump did kind of call their bluff when he gets up there and he's like, uh, Deuteronomy, whatever. It's all, <laughs> it's all of it's good. And the, because these people like worship resentment and American exceptionalism, they're like, yeah, fine, I'll go with that. Right, right. Well, like when the founding fathers wrote the Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, no, but actually on Yemen. Um, l- let me uh, let me tell you, you youngsters, a tale before. <laughs> it's a time before Hillary Clinton personally <laughs> shot Bin Laden in the face. Um, uh, but you know, this, this, when you yeah. were hosting the Celebrity <laughs> Apprentice, I was zero dark thirtying America's number one enemy. <laughs> Donald, when you were out with Marla Maples, I was dismantling the Hakani Network personally. <laughs> It's like it's like the 911 truthers where it's like Dick Cheney personally fired an RPG at the plane. The Hillary, <laughs> yeah. the Hillary Clinton version of that is basically that she like was SEAL Team Six. That she she was like Seagal in Under Siege. <laughs> they, they, dro- they drummed her down to being a cook on the ship. Actually, actually, she's like Seagal in Executive Decision because she's advertised like she's going to be in the movie, but then she just goes away after the first 15 minutes. <laughs> she was on the helicopter and they were like, "We're going to crash," and she's like, "I will." You won't and just shuts the escape hatch <laughs> um anyway uh but but the you know the the what's kind of incredible in the context of what's going on in yemen right now well in a sea of in like shockingly horrifying things is is how little it's talked about in uh you know even in smarter uh, smarter news organizations are not really covering it with any nuance and part of the reason for that is that uh, almost no one has reporters on the ground but also it's i sort of liken it to what happened in the 90s during the civil war in Yugoslavia, where it's like either you understand the history of it or you don't, and that's going to determine like what the, the strength of your analysis. And, you know, it's it's a real, these are really complicated countries and Americans don't do history good. Um, and I think that, you know, it's really important for people to understand the role of Hillary Clinton in creating this current massacre in, in Yemen. You know, when Hillary Clinton was, when she became Secretary of State, you know, first of all, this is someone who is, you know, American equivalent of, um, you know, of, of of someone from a you know monarchist family. I mean, the, the the Bushes and the Clintons are the closest thing we have to, like, royal families in this country, and they're people that are very close to uh, what what we can call maybe the parallel shadow government in this country, the the unelected bureaucracy that runs the CIA and the military and various intelligence agencies, no matter who's in power, and they can wait out any elected official. Deep blue state. Right, deep blue yeah. state. Yeah, well, and a lot of it is, you know, I mean, you know, look, you look at it, Admiral William McRaven, SEAL Team 6, registered Democrat, Stanley McChrystal, registered Democrat, uh, Chris Wallace of Fox News the other day, although I wouldn't compare him to a Navy SEAL, but he he's like the opposite of Navy SEAL. He's better. I, he's, I, I, so much I consider better. him, he's a deficit warrior. Yeah. That's even greater than a SEAL. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Whose podcast are you preparing for? Um, but, but you know, to understand, so when Hillary Clinton comes in as Secretary of State, because of her time in the Senate, but more importantly, around Bill's administration, and the fact that she watched how they orchestrated a variety of, you know, democratic wars, the sort of military humanitarian uh, operations that they prided themselves on doing, um, she, she came in knowing how to sort of wax the, the wheels of, of, of the bureaucracy. And as a result, she she presided over a pretty substantial paramilitarization of the State Department. And, you know, historically, the CIA and the military and U.S. embassies had a strained relationship in the aftermath of uh, of the 1970s and the exposing of the C- church committee, C- and, the church yeah. committee and the House Committee on Political Assassinations. Um, and, and, you know, Rumsfeld and Cheney, when they were in power, had done quite a bit to kind of smash the, um, the any kind of friendship between the military and the CIA. Uh, you know, Rumsfeld wanted the war prosecuted in a certain way in Afghanistan. The CIA had a different idea. Rumsfeld basically cut off the CIA's pipeline of access to special operations forces. And that spurred a, um, a, a kind of turf battle that endures to this day where the CIA started then developing or redeveloping its own paramilitary capacity, primarily using contractors. And then the military started to build up the infrastructure of what started to look like a CIA-style global human intelligence program, setting up shops in a variety of countries around the world where they were uh, running assets the way that the CIA does. And you had plainclothes, undeclared military personnel 
uh, in a growing number of countries starting at about 2002, 2003. This is, this is JSOC. This is this, what you've written about right, extensively. Right. Yeah. It's the Joint Special Operations Command, which... Um, you know, is in and of itself, there's a fascinating history there. But the relevant to this conversation, you know, the way that Cheney and Rumsfeld viewed JSOC was uh, as as a complete wraparound to having to deal at all with the CIA for operations, meaning that they could keep it completely secret even from the State Department or from the intelligence committees, because the intelligence committees have, uh, you know, authority over covert uh, and clandestine operations of the CIA. But when the military engages in those same kinds of operations, then it goes to a different sort of committee, a committee that is very used to being totally deferential to the brass. And so, you know, there was a part of it was a was a kind of, I would say, smart structural decision on their part. But also it, it, it was part of their radical commitment to the idea of the unitary executive, the, the idea that the executive branch of government should have a dictatorship when it comes to national security policy. Okay, that was that was Rumsfeld and, and Cheney, but like, okay, so how then, does Hillary Clinton? So when we go to Hillary, so yeah. then Hillary comes in uh, to the State Department and basically uh, tries to patch up the relationship between the CIA and the military. And by the end of 2009, so Obama comes in in January of 2009, he receives, you know, these all access briefings where the generals and the heads and the admirals and the leaders of the intelligence uh, agencies uh, just overwhelm Obama with like all the threats, you know, that everything that could happen in this country, you know, there could be uh, another, you know, so-called spectacular attack. We have people trying to blow up airplanes and attack American embassies. And they basically, they do what everyone does and that lets them run the deck. They flood the new president with everything that possibly could go wrong as a way of justifying the continuation of their covert action programs and dirty operations, etc. Rahm Emanuel, you know, who is a horrible fuck, um, <laughs> you know, is is in on all of these briefings. Um, uh, you know, they call him the uh, wait, what is what he you know he's he he lo- he's the one digit midget or the the half well, yeah, digit yeah, midget yeah, yeah. or whatever. He's, he's he lost his the finger. Ring, yeah, finger. He's his right, his ring finger. I took a piss next to him once at the Sundance Film Festival. Please don't tell me. Okay, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to discuss. <laughs> any of the any of his anatomy anymore. I I actually I shook Rob Emanuel's hand when I was sixteen. Right after you took a leak? <laughs> no, well, uh, Did you wash it? I was, well, I was in a bathroom with Rahm Emanuel. <laughs> How does this I happen to us? slowly lifted up my shirt. <laughs> to, uh, yeah. uh, no, it was uh, it was in some Cook County Democrat bullshit. It was after the Democrats took back the House. And this is when I was like 15, 16, and I still thought I was going to be a Green Beret <laughs> who is going to come back after uh, serving in the Army and destroy Republicans by their wow, that is quite own, a childhood. Own, own logic. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was really happy about the Democrats taking back the House, and uh, it was uh, yeah. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and you, you had your first Rom encounter. Um, yeah, I was. Ex- I was actually excited to meet him. Well, Rom is in the room while you know when all this stuff is going on, and he he really doesn't care about any of these issues. His his priority. He's a you know hardcore partisan political operative, and his job was basically to start already thinking about the re-election. So, he, so he's hearing, you know, the, all of this, the threat matrix and the idea of a homegrown attack or, you know, another 9-11. And, and, and they made a decision that I think was motivated in large part by politics to basically outsource the White House policy on counterterrorism entirely to the most unsavory uh, components of the CIA and the military. And, and Hillary Clinton, then as Secretary of State, her job was to facilitate what was going to be an expanding uh, series of small covert wars in places like Yemen, Somalia. Um, then it started to go into Mali, Niger. They're spreading the footprint of these drone bases. And at the end of 2009, David Petraeus, who at the time was uh, the head of CENTCOM of U.S. Central Command, and then eventually... Uh, well, fucked a woman that wasn't his wife, gave her some cl- access to classified information. Uh, no, but he then issues this um, this order in his capacity as a CENTCOM commander authorizing uh, U.S. Special Operations Forces to begin expanding uh, their kinetic, meaning killing people, whacking people, and non-kinetic actions, meaning intelligence. And, and in the case of Yemen... Hillary, the U.S. ambassador at the time to Yemen, and then the CIA station chief in Yemen, along with David Petraeus, basically made an agreement to divvy up uh, the emerging covert wars in Yemen and Somalia. And there was some sort of a tacit agreement 
that they were going to operate parallel programs, um, but that they would coordinate with one another. And so Hillary really was the person that was deployed by Obama or deployed herself. Uh, it's uh, you know it's really unclear who was running these things at the time, uh, and 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 basically set out to figure out a way to streamline these covert operations because you're technically an ambassador in a country owns that battle space, uh, and they're supposed to know everything that's going on uh, inside the country. In the case of Pakistan, the former U.S. ambassador there, uh, Cameron Munter, clearly was not informed about many of the things that the CIA was was doing, uh, and 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 that was what the CIA wanted. But in the case of Yemen, Hillary came up with a strategy to include the diplomats um, in the kind of war games. And as a result, you had a kind of rebranded version of what Cheney and Rumsfeld were doing, but with the veneer of sort of diplomatic, uh, you know, correctness about right. the whole thing. During It seems like during most of the Obama administration and certainly a lot of what you've written about in Yemen, it, you know, it's, it's a country on the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula of which, you know, they would say there's Al-Qaeda there, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, they have training camps, etc. And for most of the Obama administration, it's been like a drone shooting gallery. For They select all these targets. It's where they killed Anwar al They killed him and his son, both U.S. citizens, in drone strikes in Yemen. However, I want to talk about now, like, it, this, this has changed because now there's a war going on in Yemen mm-hmm. and the U.S. is involved with it. I just want to, like, just to introduce, I want to read two things from, just two press clips here. These are both from last week. The first is from the New York Times. This is the paper of record from October 12th. A uh, U.S. ship off Yemen fires missiles at Houthi rebel sites. It just uh, an American warship stationed off the coast of Yemen fired cruise missiles on Thursday at radar installations that the Pentagon said had been used by Yemeni insurgents to target another American warship in two missile attacks in the last four days. The strikes against Houthi rebels marked the first time the United States has become involved militarily in the civil war between Houthis, the indigenous Shiite group with loose connections to Iran, and the Yemeni government, which is backed by Saudi Arabia and other Sunni nations. That's just sort of the news article, but then the day, a day later... Uh, this is from the Wall Street Journal editorial page, which is, you know, this is... That's where spe- I go for all my news. This is speaking for the voice of a certain kind of the American ruling yeah. class. This is sort of like the mad dog neoconservatism. Yeah. But this is, this is the, I think actually the first time they've even brought up the war in Yemen was a day after these cruise missile attacks. Uh, they said... Quoting here now, I said, uh, this from October 13th, a Saudi airstrike last week mistakenly killed civilians at a funeral in Yemen. By the way, mistakenly <laughs> yeah. killed. They, I hate they it. shot them three times. <laughs> I, I hate it when I accidentally uh, do a triple tap airstrike in uh, the same on region. On a funeral. Yeah, just by accident. <laughs> right. uh, it's like... Pencils come with erasers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll post a paste bin apology <laughs> right. about killing these 400 civilians. Quote, mistakenly killed civilians at a funeral in Yemen. And the White House is now leaking that Mr. Obama is rethinking U.S. support for the Yemen campaign. But the U.S. has made similar targeting errors in many conflicts, and Saudi bombings won't get more precise if the U.S. bugs out. The U.S. ought to be helping the Saudis with enough support that they can win in Yemen. <laughs> Which is... I mean, fucking that- impossible. <laughs> it's impossible for the Saudis to win in Yemen. There's I would like to see the transcript of what you just said, Will. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just word salad. I mean, but it also it's like absolutely no understanding of the of the role the US already is playing and has been playing for a very long time, even predating the uh, the, the Saudi, you know, obliteration of Yemen. I mean, but like like I said, like we've been using like Yemen has been like I don't even know like it almost an uncountable number of drone strikes have been taking place in Yemen over most of the Obama administration as ostensibly part of the war on terrorism to disrupt terrorist networks, et cetera, training camps, et cetera, et cetera. Often, a lot of times mistakenly, we kill innocent people, uh, as you've written about. But now, now it's become a civil war in Yemen that's now a proxy war between Basically, I don't know Saudi Arabia and Iran, and and we're, we're on the Saudi side. Could you give, just give us like just some of the background on how we got to this point? Yeah. Well, first of all, the first drone strike that the U.S. ever did outside of the declared battlefield of Afghanistan was in Yemen, and it was in November of 2002. Um, six people were killed, including an American citizen from New York State. Uh, he was supposedly not the intended target of the strike, um, but they were said to be six people that may have had connections to the bombing of the USS Cole in October of, of 2000, like right as Clinton, um, you know, was was coming into power. Uh, and, and at that time, it was the single greatest, you know, terror attack against U.S. soldiers in many years. 
uh, where I think more than a dozen um, sailors were killed on that ship. Uh, and and but but you know so Bush authorized one drone strike in Yemen, and then nothing else in Yemen from then until uh, 2009 when Obama initiated this covert air war. And in in 2000 covert at first, and I'll tell you why. Because in in December of 2009. The uh, Obama administration and Obama personally signed off on a cruise missile attack, not a drone strike, but a cruise missile attack on what the JSOC and the CIA were saying was an Al Qaeda training facility in a a small village called El Majula. And they rained down cruise missiles with cluster bombs, which are basically like flying landmines. And I mean, I've seen the after effects of uh, cluster bombs in a number of countries. First time I saw them was in Yugoslavia when the U.S. bombed a crowded marketplace uh, in in Nice, one of the one of the bigger cities in Serbia. And I went there after it, and it's you know people are shredded into. I mean, they look like meat, like ground meat, and it, they're they're one of the most horrifying weapons in terms of what they do to, to people. Um, and and so the, the, the first strike that Obama authorized was not a drone strike, not the so-called precision missiles. It was the probably the least precise weapons and, and the weapons intended to shred people, uh, you know, to death. And um, and so they rain it down and they and, and they claim, oh, this is a great victory. We've killed a number of al-Qaeda operatives. But that story, the way that it was presented in the media was that the Yemeni government said that it had conducted the airstrikes. And the U.S. actually sent a cable to the dictator of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh, congratulating him on this successful strike against al-Qaeda. When a, when Yemeni journalists went to the scene and photographed the missiles, that whole story was debunked, and the U.S. eventually was forced to admit that it had done the strike. Moreover, there, the, the, there was no one al-Qaeda there, uh, and they ended up killing three dozen people, including, uh, I think, more than half were women and uh, children. And in the film we did, Dirty Wars, we went there and, and interviewed uh, one of the survivors uh, of that massacre, but also got videos and tapes showing clearly that these were, they actually said made in the U.S. on the missiles, and we g- obtained all these photographs of it. So that was the first sort of the opening salvo in this. Just wait, quick question. Why do they keep putting made in the USA on missiles? Do you think really, they would stop by the <laughs> like, yes. missiles, tear gas shells? Why do they just got to stamp that on there? It's it really is remarkable, and I, do, I don't know the answer to that question, but I would love to know the answer to ABCs that question. ABCs always be closing. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, but it's, right, it's, well, I mean, you know, Chomsky used to have this theory that the U.S. wanted to uh, give the appearance of, of like, insanity in some cases to this sort of the Nixon, the madman. Right, theory. exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. and I don't know what I necessarily buy into it, but I think at times there are certainly sadistic fucks that do do that on behalf of the U.S. empire. I just don't know if it's official policy, but that question is actually a very fascinating one. Why the fuck would you put this on? <laughs> On your on your covert strike that you're going to let the Yemenis exactly take like, like if, it, if it was like the mob or something right. they would like file down the serial numbers right, on right. The, the piece that they used to <laughs> right. kill the well, judge. It's, like, it's like in the Waka Flocka song where he's like no mask just to let you know who did it. Oh. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, they, they say if they come at you with a mask they're coming to rob you. Right. If they come at you with no mask. <laughs> yeah, they're definitely coming for your life. <laughs> Same missile, same hood. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. That campaign of, uh, stra- I mean, it started with the cluster bombs. But and then it was, then it became pure drones. Pure drones. And it's been interesting because, you know, for years we were, we were told by the uh, Prague Progs uh, that we have to do this. We have to beat back Al Qaeda in mm-hmm. Yemen. But now since the, the Houthi takeover, the capital, since the Saudi incursion, the only times in which Saudi troops do not get pushed back into their own country is when they're fighting alongside AQAP, Mm -hmm. who have been able to take massive amounts of territory in southern Yemen along the coast. Right. Well, first of all, let's let's break this down, because, you know, if you go back, I was tweeting about this the other day, Fran Townsend, who, you know, was a a Bush Homeland Security official, uh, then she was a CNN commentator, and now I'm not exactly sure what she does, but but she, if you look in the WikiLeaks cables uh, from that era... Fran Townsend and other Bush officials would be in these meetings with Ali Abdullah Saleh, the dictator of Yemen, and he would say, you know, you need to let us use your counterterrorism funding and weapons that you're giving us to fight al-Qaeda against the Houthis because the Houthis are backed by Iran. And the Bush people were like, no, this guy's full of shit. There's no evidence mm-hmm. to suggest that, which, you know, it's, I'm not praising the Bush people, you know, but but on this specific issue, they, they were right. There was no major Iranian backing. It, it's like the idea that, I mean, the Houthis, their slogan it's, they're, is- They're both Shia. 
Right, like there's Zaidi Shia. The well, and and like, so, so was Ali Abdullah Saleh. Yeah. He was a right. Zaidi Shiite from their region, and he mercilessly bombarded them with and without U.S. weaponry for six wars. You know, I mean, they, these guys were in a war all through the 2000s. Um, and so so the Bush people said, no, that's bullshit. And they were telling Saleh, you can't use your counterterrorism funding to fight the Houthis. And they, they actually thought, well, if they, but because if we do that, it could draw Iran in. The Obama people completely fell for it. And Saleh himself, uh, ha- you know, if you talk to most Yemenis who really understand this situation, uh, the current situation, they will tell you that none of this would have happened without Al- Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, allowing it to happen. The Houthis would not have taken the capital. So Saleh is still very much in control of the internal dynamics. Um, and he has done this throughout his 30 year history of presiding over various parts of Yemen, um, where he'll play both sides. He's deeply connected to Al Qaeda people. He's deeply connected to Houthi people. He'll allow one to sort of advance while the other has to retreat. And, and none of it has to do with international geopolitical questions. It's all about the internal tribal structure within Yemen. And, and when the so-called Arab Spring uprisings happened, you know, Saleh was massacring protesters with U.S. weaponry. Um, and, and he left basically because it was easier. He left power because it was easier to let someone else deal with the, you know, the rat fuck that was created there and then be a behind the scenes broker. So, so now you have a situation where Iran actually is starting to uh, give uh, certainly logistical support to the Houthis and probably military support. But the Saudis didn't just start bombing Yemen a couple of years ago. They've been bombing Yemen for more than a decade uh, with U.S. weaponry. And they've they've committed some of the, I mean, the U.S. drone strikes have killed large numbers of people. The Saudi conventional airstrikes just dwarf the totality of the U.S. drone war there. Can we... I, can, can we just like uh, like nail down though like what what is like the genesis of this 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 civil war in in Yemen because I don't think I'm even sure of it. Well, so the, I mean the the the, the um, kind of interesting thing about the Houthis in this context is that they've they've never had you know an eye on like conquering all of Yemen. They definitely are viewed as apostates by the majority of the Yemeni population because they are they're a minority even within a minority. They're Zaidi Shiite uh, Muslims and they you know they practice a a, a, a sort of uh, charismatic version of Shiite Islam. They're, they're not even, you know, conventional Shiites. And uh, and and you have, you know, Yemen, which is a fairly, you know, massive majority uh, Sunni population. Culturally, there's just huge differences. And and the, there have been uh, wars in uh, between the central government, which is primarily Sunni, although. Ali Abdullah Saleh is from that area of the Zaidi Shiites, which is a whole other question. I mean, he's a very crafty, you know, he's like a mini Saddam. He's a very crafty diplomat, good chess player in terms of diplomacy and dealing with the U.S. And so basically the, the Houthis just wanted autonomy in their area. And the Saudis viewed the Houthis as a potential threat if they extended their territory far enough to allow a pipeline for Iran to uh, have access to Saudi territory in a way that would threaten Saudi's border. And that's kind of the the, the stated logic for why uh, Saudi Arabia is doing this, is that if you have a foreign hostile power like Iran uh, backing a, you know, a, a small militia, empowering it to such a point that they could take the capital, then our uh, security is at stake and we need to defeat that enemy. And, and that's that's the, the the context of it is that the Saudis have used the Houthis to justify their own military operations. And the Iranians now are using the Saudi campaign against the Houthis as a, as, as a real opportunity to break into uh, a sphere of influence they really haven't been able to, despite all the propaganda about it. Iran never really was able to break into Yemeni society. Yeah, and the, there's an interesting mirror between uh, the chain of events that led Saudi Arabia into Yemen with the level of involvement they've been in and the sort of expansion the deep state that you've talked about in the last uh 15 to 16 years the saudi arabia was never like an overt invade a country type place they i mean since uh the grand mosque seizure in 1979 when they had to take back the grand mosque they couldn't even their troops were totally unsuccessful they had to famously bring in french and pakistani commandos and had to briefly convert the French commando commandos to Islam so that they could breach the right. mosque. Uh, <laughs> but this sort of, it was a grand humiliation, but it started this, it exacerbated this already existing policy of using proxy groups all around the world. And they were very successful at that, using 
different groups in different regions to you know strike at regional enemies and achieve their aims but they never really had an army they had an air force which is where the aristocracy would go it was like the cavalry Mm -hmm. they never really had an army and when they wanted to go into Yemen last year, they didn't want to go in with their own troops. They wanted no, to they use mercenaries. Right. They wanted to use Pakistani troops at first, and Pakistan totally punted on that. They put it up for a vote in parliament, which, right. you know, who the fuck is going to yeah. vote yes right. on that? <laughs> I want to give the yeah. I want to give the fucking foul sons yeah. all our troops. Uh, <laughs> right. And they wanted to use uh, troops from Oman, too. But, yeah, no, they've had to use a combination of their own troops, troops, Colombian mercenaries, yep. even... Well, some Blackwater Americans too, guys. yeah, yeah. Blo- former yeah, I mean, you have you have this this weird network that still exists <laughs> of like former elements of Blackwater, and for a while they were operating in the United Arab Emirates, and 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 then that's shifted over to Qatar, and you know there still is a, a lot of activity. Eric Prince himself now is primarily working for China and in China, but you know his colleagues are all very active inside of uh, Yemen and in support of Saudi. But to your direct point about the Saudi military capacity. But part of this has actually nothing to do with Yemen and has a lot to do with the kingdom's preservation of itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think part of this is meant as a warning uh, domestically to anyone that would rise up against the royal family. You know, Saudi Arabia is is basically like a mini version of, uh, of, of Kim Jong-un's North Korea in terms of how lockdown information is and you mm-hmm. have you know bits and pieces trickle out about uprisings and battles but you you really don't hear much about what's happening inside of Saudi Arabia unless someone escapes and the other thing is that you the the, the kind of um, the kind of uh, articulation of jihad from the people that were at the core of al-qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula resonated with poor and rural uh, communities in Saudi Arabia and I think that the Saudi royals, don't so much fear Yemen as a military power or really the the Houthis as an existential threat, but rather the idea that their corruption of Islam is regularly being exposed, particularly in the context of all of the support that they're getting from the United States. So they do have their own geostrategic interest in Yemen, no question, but part of it is a message to anyone that dissents against them. The most bulletproof way you can make sure that you get killed by the Saudi state is to oppose them politically or religiously. Mm-hmm. They, I mean, I I have something being edited right now about sort of civil life in Saudi Arabia. And if you're, if you're found to be gay or you're found to be an atheist, you, your punishment sort of depends on who your family knows, how mad the conservatives in your town are, where you live, yeah. what Sharia judge you get. But if you oppose, if you speak up politically or religiously, you're fucked. And, you know, January of this year... They executed Namir al Namir, the Shia cleric, who wasn't even yeah. sectarian. He just was a Shia who happened to speak out against sectarianism. And they, the biggest threat to them is any view of the world that doesn't completely affirm their own. But they just executed a guy whose whose father or is is like uh, you know one of the top uh, people in the royal family uh, on a murder charge. But he actually was yeah he was sentenced to death and executed. And you know, you wonder like, what is was it? Was it really because he murdered his friend when they were camping somewhere, or was there was he you know sort of working with potential coup plotters? I I, I wouldn't be surprised if we wake up one day and like huge chaos is has broken out inside of Saudi Arabia. It's one of those countries that it, you know it's it's sort of like you know Ceausescu and Kim Jong Un and, and you know you could, you could see it just happening all of a sudden. And I think the Saudis are very concerned about that. It's part of the reason why like Bahrain wanted to hire non Muslim troops to come in during the uprisings there. They're very concerned about the idea of Muslims having to kill Muslims. And I think the Saudis are are really sort of wargaming some of their emergency response plans. But but from the U.S. perspective or from the U.S. side of this, remember that John Brennan was the CIA station chief in Saudi Arabia. He's extremely close, the current director of the CIA, extremely close to the royal family. And their drone program that you know Brennan really sort of pushed forward in an aggressive way um, has almost entirely depended on intelligence fed to the United States by Saudi Arabia and a network of shady informants connected to the former government of Ali Abdullah Saleh. And so the, the concept, you know, one of the consequences of the U.S. sort of wholesale outsourcing its collection of intelligence to Saudi Arabia is that the U.S. has found itself now doing the Saudis. Bidding. Yeah, sounds like yeah. we're doing their dirty work. And, the, and yeah, the entire GID, General Intelligence Directorate, the Saudi, it's... 
I mean, it's never been like a normal intelligence collecting body. It just it specifically exists to preserve the royal family. Right. It's, yeah. No, yeah. they're not. They're not interested in taking out your SIM card. They're more interested in like taking out your fingernails. And it's yeah. Like, very, but although I mean, Brennan, you know, seems to be okay with that. But the, the you know the ironic or actually not, it's not ironic. The kind of classic American thing going on right now in Yemen is that the U.S. is simultaneously um, attacking multiple sides within the war and supporting multiple sides. You have Al Qaeda is against the Houthis. And that's their that's been their primary goal to eliminate the Houthis for many many years. Way more important to them than destroying the great Satan. You know, they mm-hmm. they they want to kill the apostates. And and that's like when I used to communicate with people from AQAP, that's what they would always say. Our main thing is we're going after the Houthis. We want to stop the Houthis from taking Sanaa. We want to you know, they're not saying like we want to blow up uh, you know, the a, a UPS plane or send a parcel bomb to a Jewish community center in Chicago. It was we want to kill all these people. Um, so the, the United States is is still drone striking against, supposedly against Al Qaeda, but Al Qaeda is fighting the Houthis, who the United States are supposedly sp- supporting the Saudis to you know massacre. The U.S. is then supporting the Saudis, who are simultaneously working with Al Qaeda on other things inside of Yemen. And it's it's you know the whole thing is is really like a, a Henry Kissinger wet dream. It's just all Muslims killing each other, and we, we don't have to do anything. And it doesn't quite matter who who wins at this point. It's just we'll kill them all. It's to quote our our hero Ron Fournier. Uh, <laughs> all sides do it. Uh, Applebee's Yemen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. But it, but I, I mean, I love the conventional wisdom warriors who know so little about so much, and they just constantly tell us how you know the little that they know. And it turns out that that's also completely full of shit. Uh, and it's why, like, you know, watching people like Chuck Todd discuss anything about foreign policy, it just makes my, I mean, what my fucking head want to explode. <laughs> you know, p- putting Chuck Todd and Joanne Reed, uh, like, in my <laughs> living room and, and strapping me to a chair so I couldn't leave and having to listen to them for, like, 12 hours, I would find a way to, like, kill myself with my teeth. No, but I've, I've you know, I've, I used to be on those shows quite a bit, and I would attack MSNBC on MSNBC's own Famously ripped airways. apart Torre, yeah. <laughs> oh, Torre, and also uh, Samantha Power on Democracy mm. Now!, who I believe we talked about just two weeks ago yeah. with Chase Madar. You know, mm-hmm. once you're in, like, once you're in the club... Yeah. You're well, in the club, but also my, my, you know, you you get this the 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 Obama bots, you know, will will say, you know, what do you want, a hundred, a hundred and fifty thousand ground troops in Yemen? But like, is that all your brain will allow? That it's either drone strikes or boots on the ground? How about we shouldn't have done any of this? But had we just left Yemen alone, what actually would have happened? Would we have been able to apprehend Anwar al uh, the American-born cleric who was, you know, I, I think he was guilty of crimes. I think he should have been arrested. I think he should have been, on, been put on trial. Um, he was drone struck in an empty village outside of his family's uh, area of influence with no other houses around, and they fucking just blew him up. Why? They don't want to put him on trial. They don't want him to lawyer up and have great lawyers in the United States and try to flip the sw- the script and say to the United States, well, you know, here's everything, you know, that you guys did uh, in these wars. He, he would know he was going to either be put to death or spend life in prison, but he damn sure would have put on a defense. They didn't, they didn't, and they also don't want to talk about whether or not he was an FBI informant at one point, mm-hmm. which I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest he was. Okay, now, yeah, right I mean, after it's... 9-11, he was like a guy who was like, didn't he do something with the Bush administration, like American Muslims speak out, he, or like he was like... Well, it, first of all, he was invited to be the the keynote speaker at a luncheon at the Pentagon after 9-11, and he actually went to the Pentagon and gave a lecture about Islam in the world to Pentagon employees. And we got through the Freedom of Information Act uh, the, some documents about that, and there's really nothing good in that in that cache except a document that shows the menu for that day, and one of the choices was a bacon sandwich. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> you know, in a Holy sea of bad shit. intelligence failures <laughs> in the bush. Holy shit. Holy Do you think that Iman would like mayonnaise with his bacon sandwich? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, but if you want to apprehend him and put him on trial, uh, then the U.S. is going to be put on trial. You know, in a way, Clinton, Bill Clinton was lucky that Slobodan Milosevic died in the middle of his trial at The Hague because Milosevic was trying to subpoena General Wesley Clark, who was the supreme allied commander of NATO during the 78-day bombing of Yugoslavia. He wanted to uh, subpoena William Cohen, former defense secretary. He tried to subpoena Bill Clinton himself. And I'm not, I mean, Milosevic was a horrifying war criminal, but he was not a stupid person. And he also, he understood that the information he possessed about 
what the United States had done with him and other powers in that country, no one wants to, the U.S. doesn't want that stuff aired. You don't talk about that stuff. Same with bin Laden. <laughs> back to uh, back to Casino. This is like when <laughs> Philip Green's silent partner was like, I will not be quiet. Yeah, I will not. Yeah. He's like, Jordan, they sent me to shuttle it out of court. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, but yeah, no, going back to the the liberals talking liberals seem to live in this weird binary world i mean today today uh someone showed me this screenshot of this jamel boy tweet where he goes you know given the choice between um not raising the debt ceiling and defaulting on debt and war with iran i will take war with iran and no, it's wait, like what real? fucking yeah yeah, he, yeah what he said that. i don't know what context is there a blue was, check mark yeah, next to that I, I don't know what context it was in but taking it's like what fucking universe you live in that these are the choices like, that's on offer yeah but but also you know if we if like if we actually took these issues seriously in this society we would have when, when the killing of osama bin laden happened it would have been a perfect time for us to discuss who we are as a nation uh i personally believe that osama bin laden was assassinated uh, rather executed um i don't believe there was any intention whatsoever this was like, it was like pablo of, it was like yeah, Escobar. Right, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Not, yeah yeah it, it's not you know and we don't even know a fraction of the criminal activity that's taken place since 9-11. I mean, well, it's true of the entire American empire, but let's say just since 9-11 under both Bush and Obama. But there is no fucking way in hell that those guys were sent in there with a mission to capture Osama bin Laden. First of all, where's Obama going to put Osama bin Laden? Is he going to send him to Guantanamo? Is he going to try to make the argument he should be at a supermax prison in, in the United States? Does he want to fight that battle with the Republicans? But also, bin Laden would lawyer up. Bin Laden knows a lot about, well, let's say Afghanistan, the CIA support for the Mujahideen, etc. They don't want these guys on trial. And, you know, General Crazy Beans uh, uh, Flynn, you know, Michael Flynn, who's my guy, Trump's. I mean, he's amazing. I love him. He's you know, he's he's Trump's like top guy. And he is such a bucket full of nutty. But he actually knows shit about this stuff. And he even says, you know, look, the reason that Obama wants to use all these drones is he doesn't want to have to put them in jail somewhere. Because the reality is, when you capture people, there are different legal statuses of uh, of them. And what do you do with a guy like Osama bin Laden? But for me in our society, the, you don't judge how, like what your values are based on like how you treat Michelle Obama if she's caught jaywalking. You, you do it on like a horrible, reprehensible piece of shit like Osama bin Laden. And you say, this is going to show that we actually are a different kind of nation. But it, we never have been. It would be awkward, though. I mean, like for if let's say that we did arrest him, it would be like the 80s action movie. Where they're like, God damn it. I told you he had to get a pillow in his cell. <laughs> yeah. You read him his rights. You know, like, oh, Osama's out on bail. I guess yeah. there's nothing we can do. Osama, Osama. And, then, and then he immediately just like blows up a shopping mall or something. It would be like New Jack City when they have uh, when they have Nino Brown on trial. <laughs> no, but it would have been amazing if, if like if Johnny Cochran was still alive. Yeah. If Shot Johnny him. Cochran was uh, was Bin Laden's lawyer. If, 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 the second season of American Crime Story would have been yeah. so it, dope. It'd be though. Fucking lit. <laughs> if Prince Turkey is murky, then. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I but I do think that that's that's part of what we see with this horrible, vapid state. It's really particularly like stench uh, among the uh, Democrats. You know, they they are they they are such like sort of law and order warriors now. Like O. Willis, you know that. Guy. <laughs> There's, oh, oh, interesting thing about O. Willis, he runs a uh, parody. He runs a parody news site, uh, but the only stock images he's bought of it are of women's feet. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Like you well, look up his site. But this, what, 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 what's happened under Obama, and this happened to an extent, um, you know, under Clinton. When I, I cut my teeth as a reporter while Clinton was president, and I think it's part of why I don't have, I, I don't view the Democrats in power any differently than I view Republicans. I think they're all pieces of shit that deserve to be held accountable. And, uh, and I think that you know this current younger generation of of establishment journalists grew up in you know in the sort of uh, bush era and and mm. they're taught to this narrative that it's like democrats are the good guys republicans are the bad guys when in reality you can draw a pretty straight line from Iraq policy for instance from the advent of the Iran Iraq war all the way to the present day whether it's democrats or republicans there's been a pretty consistent uh, U.S. posture, uh, where it's it's been consistently anti-Iraqi people, um, but also there's just the the this war has extended in Iraq since 1979, um, and and the U.S. has been involved with it at, at you know every step of the way. Clinton, Bill Clinton, 
initiated the longest sustained bombing campaign since Vietnam uh, during his presidency against Iraq under the guise of the so-called no-fly zones, bombing Iraq an average of once every three days during the latter half of his time in office. Uh, then you had uh, Clinton sign into law the Iraq Liberation Act in 1998, which Bernie Sanders supported, that made uh, regime change official policy of the United States. So it was the precursor to uh, the blank check that was then given to Bush, uh, including by Bill Clinton's wife, Hillary Clinton, when she you know supported it and said that she she misunderstood. She thought that it was they were authorizing inspectors to go in, which is the biggest <laughs> pile of bullshit. He, uh, you, you uh, about Bernie Sanders, I just would like to say about Bernie, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he thought that the Iraqi people uh, deserve the regime change, which I think would be appropriate. <laughs> right, and and the thing is that like I having spent a lot of time in Saddam's Iraq, I I do think Iraq would have been a country where where similar to what happened with Mubarak initially, I do think that there would have been an overwhelming uprising. And I think that the military would have eventually joined in, in something resembling a coup. Uh, in fact, in the, the month before the bombing began, um, in 2003, in, I was in Baghdad and there were, uh, there was the whole, the rumor sort of mafia was pushing this idea, meaning Iraqi elites pushing this idea that uh, Saddam was going to give power to Uday Hussein, like sort of on the eve of the war. And, <laughs> you know, Uday was like the scary guy that like has his tiger eat people. And, um, you know, but but with the the idea being that he kind of knew that his his days were were numbered and was going to look for some kind of an exit. I don't know if there was anything to it, but it was clear that they knew that their their time and their time in power was was closing down. And the last time I saw Tarek Aziz, who was the deputy foreign minister and, and really the public face of Iraq to the world, you know, that he was a Christian and was in Saddam's inner circle going all the way back to the bath party days. Um, and day he, ones, baby. Splish <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I was taking a back. Um, <laughs> But he, no, he was, and he, dude, he was such a gangster, man. He would smoke these Cuban cigars and he, he would, he'd greet you. He'd be wearing like his military fatigues with like house slippers and he had the amazing Run DMC glasses. I was like, every time you went in there, you're like, damn, this is the original gangster, Tarek Aziz. And, but he said, the last time I talked to him and he had, in the years that I knew him, he had never said something like this. He said, you know, the Americans can overthrow Saddam Hussein. They never would say that before. Okay, he says the Americans can overthrow Saddam Hussein. They can invade Iraq, but they will open a box they'll never be able to close because the only thing that can counter the rising tide of Islamic, you know, fundamentalist movements uh, it is a sense of Arab nationalism. And if you look at it from a much bigger perspective, what has happened, you know, in over the past 40, 50 years in the Middle East is that the, the United States has been a part of systematically dismantling or crushing all aspects of what people in Western countries would consider sort of civilized institutions, secular education. I mean, in Iraq under Saddam, women worked in every job of society. You could have a taxi driven by a woman in Saddam's Iraq. You weren't allowed to say anything bad. You'd get your tongue cut out or you or worse. Um, but when you dis, when they destroyed the secular kind of presence um, or, or centers of power in, in these a variety of countries, it gave rise to something that can't be manipulated in the same way as military dictatorships, because you now have multiple generations of young people born into this shitstorm that was created by their own thugs and our thugs. And, and they're growing up with the reality that uh, there is a war against their religion. That's, that's how they are believing it. And how can you blame them given the set of facts in front of them? I'm not saying that the US necessarily is trying to destroy Islam as a religion, but if I was living in one of these things, yeah, and I what, was, what would the difference be? Right. Well, if it, I mean, how would it seem differently purposes, to you if they weren't? Yes, you I know? mean, for all practical purposes, it that that has been the end result. Uh, you know, in terms of of, of uh, communicating what U.S. policy is. But what's happened on the micro level in a lot of these countries is that when the civil society institutions were destroyed, um, you know, people turned to the forces that were able to collect the garbage, uh, educate your kids. Um, help you find housing, uh, give aid to refugees. And a lot of those institutions are very radical uh, Islamic centers of micropower. Uh, so Muqtada al-Sadr, when, when the Iraq invasion first happened, you know, he had the Mahdi army, and, and that was, you know, the U.S. was always talking about the Mahdi army. However, the most significant thing that Sadr did was to, like, collect the garbage in what Saddam Hussein cynically named, you know, Saddam City, which was this huge ghetto of uh, of Shiites in Baghdad. Uh, they started collecting the garbage. They started patrolling the streets to try to confront any kind of looting, etc. They then sent blood uh, to the Sunni fighters who were rising up in Fallujah. 
uh, against the United States. Sadr's people organized a blood drive. What's the point there? The point is, Sadr, yes, he's a radical Shiite uh, religious figure, but he speaks in the in the language of the street in nationalistic terms about Iraq. And that's what the United States really, I think, has destroyed uh, in these countries. Same thing with the Taliban. In Afghanistan, by killing off the old guard of the Taliban, you have no one to negotiate with. You, you've created a condition where what you claimed was this horrifying terrorist threat actually would have been much more reasonable to deal with you know, than the current um, crop of you know wackos and Jeremy, insane people. Have you read um, Andrew Coburn's book about uh, drone drone yeah. wars? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the fascinating points he makes in that about like the whole strategy of targeted assassination of terrorist leaders, right? Yeah. Whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan or elsewhere. He said, like, the, the guys who really, like, study the the data on this have found that every time that we take out one of these, you know, top leaders or whatever, more violence happens. Mm -hmm. And it's a similar thing happened in the drug war in, in South America and Mexico, where you take out these drug lords that you think are like, you know, you cut off the head of the snake. It's, it's a hydra. What it does, it, like, the lieutenants or whatever... It creates a power vacuum, and then they just start killing people to show that they're they're on top. Like they have they have that hand on things. As far as I'm concerned, this is like 9/11. Tony wanted our attention. Fine, he got our attention. Now we wipe him off the planet. You know that fat cocksucker says I look like the Shah of Iran, the wacker boss. I won't do that. It's been done before, and it was wrong then. It just keeps no, happening. I mean, that's, yeah, that, that's an excellent point, and and you know the. The the era when um, the, the sort of groups like FARC, for instance, in Colombia, you know, FARC at its beginning had, uh, you know, at least the the sort of uh, they were pretending at least to have some political motivation for uh, for their actions, and you know, eventually transformed into almost exclusively, you know, a narco trafficking paramilitary gangster squad. But there, there were politics at the beginning of it, and it was sort of, you know, I, I, I think it was largely bullshit. But there was some semblance of an understandable ideology that they were promoting to defend their actions. Um, the same is true with the Taliban. Same is true with Al Qaeda. You know, Bin Laden and Zawahiri look very reasonable compared to uh, Baghdadi, ISIS. Yeah, Baghdadi, yeah. whatever. But yeah, but compared to like what we hear from ISIS, Bin Laden would always sort of you know, go through the process of saying, you know, we're giving you a chance to, you know, uh, leave the, you know, get your troops out of Saudi Arabia. And, you know, and there was a sense that they lived in the modern world uh, and understood how nation states functioned. Um, with with ISIS, there's no sense of that whatsoever. With the Taliban, you know, first of all, there's a difference between the Taliban government, which the U.S. overthrew, um, you know, pretty swiftly after 9-11, um, and that, and that what, what is generically called the Taliban, meaning the insurgent groups that are fighting the United States inside of Afghanistan. Taliban government was made up of uh, a mishmash of people, some of whom were quite well educated. Uh, I, I, I met a few years ago in Afghanistan with uh, uh, Muwatakil, who was the um, Taliban foreign minister at the time of 9-11. And he told me the story of how they tried to offer, they had bin Laden under a default sort of house arrest near Kandahar. This is this, after 9-11, right before the United States started bombing in October of 2001. And they sent through a back channels a message to the United States offering to hand bin Laden over um, to an Islamic country where he could be tried in a Sharia court. And they actually offered to send him to Saudi Arabia, which would have loved to chop Osama bin Laden's head off. Um, and the United States rejected. Well, this would have handled our problem about not putting him on trial, right? Just right, which is, which is, you know, and, and, and it's still, it would have been, it, that would have been a very brutal thing too. But the, the point that the Taliban government, and I think, I, I do think that those who are, who are actually literate within that government, because you have a wide illiteracy in Afghanistan, I don't think it was insincere. I don't think it was bullshit. I think they really were thinking, Fuck, man, we like we don't want to link our horse to this guy. And and I do think they were really saying we need to save face. Can he go be put in trial in a Sharia thing? But the point wasn't really about Osama bin Laden at that point. They wanted their war. They were going to get their war. You hand over Osama bin Laden. Then what happens? Then you have to say, yeah. oh, well, but but you have oil deals with the Taliban government going back to the 90s. And George H.W. Bush was involved with it. The, you know, the U.S. Has, has been playing both sides 
of so many conflicts that you almost have no choice but to bump people off when you've decided that they're the next Hitler. Because if you put them on trial, they're going to talk shit about you and like people might actually hear some truths about what we did. Uh, what, Gaddafi what? is another oh, great yeah. example of that. We did it. We did him dirty. Uh, look, I'm not surprised to see another dude bro from the Intercept attacking <laughs> the U.S. deep state for simply being bipartisan in all these countries. <laughs> hey, there's not Republican cruise missiles and Democrat cruise missiles. There's American <laughs> cruise missiles. I can see it's, my- They say it right no, on them. No, I mean, no, who is more no labels than right. Stanley McChrystal? <laughs> Well, I loved in the in the uh, in the Podesta emails. I mean, but besides his amazing risotto recipe, was the this, <laughs> this, <laughs> this thing about uh, when they they uh, you know they were contemplating who the VP would be, and one of the choices was Admiral William McRaven. Yes, um, yes, yes. And it would have been like I tweeted a couple years ago about this, saying like I bet you any money Hillary will like try to get McRaven to be her VP, and and fuck yeah, he was on the list. No, I mean he's a gangster too. Like these guys I mean, like are his name people. alone. Yeah. I mean, That's such a yeah. fucking. Yeah. Tom Clancy name like yeah. he is yeah you know he wanted to be a he went to he has a degree in journalism and he wanted Mick Raven and he want he actually wanted to be like a reporter and then he decided he wanted to be James Bond he actually yeah. thought said he wanted to be James Bond like most reporters that's, most, yeah, yeah. that's sad like, he's that's, the James, that's, James Bond of report who would the James Bond of reporting be that, today uh, Michael Weiss <laughs> 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 of course. Can Mike what? Barnacle be like the older version of it? <laughs> Michael, Michael. Mike, Mike Barnacle is the Timothy Dalton yeah. James Bond. I think, uh, okay, so that makes Speech Boy 71 uh, Felix Leiter. Yeah. <laughs> no, just the, the, the last thing I want to talk about, like like back to Yemen, is back to this idea that this, that as a proxy war between the US and Saudi Arabia and Iran, which is being played up for all it's worth, like I said, back to that Wall Street Journal thing, I'm just reading right now from uh, Commentary Magazine, another one of my favorites. This mm. is Michael Rubin. He says, Hell yeah. Indeed, the Houthis represent perhaps the clearest example of Iranian imperialism. <laughs> Can we talk about just that phrase, Iranian imperialism? That's for a so second? good. <laughs> There's not a big enough golden toilet to put that bullshit <laughs> in, like, in the world. I mean, for, again, anyone who knows anything about this knows that the Iranians wanted, did want to influence the Houthis. But Yemen is not, uh, Ye- Yemen is primarily a tribal organized country. And this isn't like some Orientalist analysis. This is based on, you know, being there on the ground, but also knowing Yemenis from a variety of tribes and the history of how South Yemen uh, ended up reunifying with North Yemen um, and the sort of the British time there, etc. You have to understand a deeper history to Yemen to make any analysis or to offer any analysis about Iran's role in this. The fact is that Iran has never been able to break in to being a significant power inside of Yemen beyond sort of really superficial propaganda campaigns and, um, you know, kind of uh, sharing a a set of uh, rhetorical devices with the Houthis. Um, But the Saudis have always been deeply involved inside of Yemen. Uh, and that goes back for a long, long time uh, to when the British left in the, you know, in the, in, in the 60s, you had this uh, ex- this sort of like fleeing of all of these wealthy individuals who were tribal leaders inside of Yemen that were backed by the British. And then they were expelled. They lost their land. Saleh gave them access to come back into the country uh, as a way of unifying it. And so you had all of these people that had lived in Saudi Arabia, lived in the United Arab Emirates, uh, in Qatar, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, all of a sudden coming back to a country they hadn't been to for many, many years, in some cases decades, and then reclaiming Uh, huge swaths of territory. And those people made a deal with the devil of sorts, with Ali Abdullah Saleh, to support him politically in return for him allowing them to reclaim all of this territory. And, and, And the Houthis have almost nothing to do with that story. They have their own area in a fairly undesirable part of Yemen. And, and they have been sort of in the middle of a lot of people's uh, internal wars, and so the, the but, but like, so the, the idea that the Houthis represent Iranian imperialism. I mean, the Houthis are generally an extremely impoverished people that have been mercilessly militarily attacked by both the U.S.-backed government of Ali Abdullah Saleh at the time and the Saudis repeatedly. Uh, the, the people that make claims like that are, are people that are just like reading the slogan, or people that think that like Hillary Clinton's can speech tells you everything you need to know about what she's going to do in power. Like it's the same level of intellectual sophistication as thinking that a politician's tin can speech 
is their actual agenda. Well, it's sort of like, you know, if you're the Wall Street Journal or Commentary Magazine, like you probably don't know what you're talking about, but it doesn't really matter. You don't care what you're talking about because like, are you willing to say anything? Because the goal, again, is, I I think war with iran they want to get they, like iran is always in their sights that's the that's their white whale for a lot of these wrong people. you're wrong oh no it's not wrong, wrong. no i i i think that tr- i think if trump were elected i do think that there that there'd be a serious possibility of the u.s doing some insane military action in iran um the israelis depending on who stays in power in israel i mean israel already has done strikes inside of uh iran from time to time and they definitely have bumped off nuclear scientists. Um, yeah. And there's questions about whether or not the U.S. has actually been directly involved with bumping off those scientists. But I don't think Hillary Clinton would uh, contemplate an overt war in Iran. I, I don't I don't I, Christ, I don't see I, that. I happening. hope not. But I mean, I guess I guess the point is, like, because of that, you have them urging America to back Saudi Saudi Arabia to the hilt in this what is an unwinnable conflict for them. Basically, yeah, but 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 also, I, I mean, I, I get what your point is, but if you if you look at uh, if you step away from Yemen for a second and look at Iraq, the end result of U.S. policy in Iraq has been that the Iranians have infinitely more power right. and influence, mm-hmm. uh, and it's growing every week in in Iraq than would have been fathomable uh, twenty years ago to imagine. And I just well, like, yeah. but, but, like but, you, but but so why isn't it that we're, I mean that's actually where you have uh, tangible evidence of the Iranians gaining military and geopolitical footholds in a strategically incredibly important country well, to the global oil economy. I will, yeah, obviously that's why they don't want to talk about that. But like, you know, it, it just the idea is like we all we always hear from this certain crowd of people that they're very concerned about Iranian influence or Iranian meddling in foreign countries and it's just like but but think think of think of the insanity uh, and and the the lack of knowledge that's required for to make those kinds of statements that you were reading the the Shiites are a tiny minority in Yemen that that even Bush's people understand had no connection, uh, t- like meaningful connection to Iran outside of sharing the slogan "Death to America" and some propaganda uh, campaigns. The, Al Qaeda was fighting the Houthis. The central government of Yemen was fighting the Houthis. Saudi was doing covert operations against the Houthis. Who allowed the Houthis to take power? It was Ali Abdullah Saleh. So, I mean, like, is it really that the United States is so stupid that they fell for like Saleh's shell game? You know, and it's like, well, well, he didn't know the ball was in that cup. Or is there something else at play here? And that's why I think that. You know, it's it's not really just. It's certainly not just about Yemen and potential threats in Yemen. Uh, Iran feels like a kind of convenient punching bag on all of this. The Saudis probably are, are, are there, there's there's certainly a, a geographic uh, importance to Yemen for oil pipelines and the Gulf of Aden. Uh, so I'm not saying, oh, it's all about the oil, but I do think that this, that when, when we actually sort of dig through everything at the end of the day, we're going to find that the reason that the Saudis really wanted this had more to do with their own internal status as 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 the dictators of Saudi and also their status within OPEC and the production and dissemination of oil around the world. I do have one follow up for that. Uh, given that the Saudis, uh, they didn't get really the war that they planned on for Yemen. I mean, there is something at play with them sort of restricting different views of Islam, different political ideologies that will come in and come out. And it's, there's some of that there, but I mean, do they have, it seems like they have no way out now. There's no way out. There is no way for them to end their involvement there. And they've, you know, going back to Tariq Aziz, they've opened a box that they can't contain. Mm -hmm. What is, how do you see them sort of closing out their involvement there if they can? Right. I mean, it, it, you could say that, that that this could potentially turn into like Saudi's Vietnam, except as you pointed out earlier, Saudi is basically has none of its troops on the ground. I mean, they do have certain uh, coordinator. You know, it's similar to what the Vietnam, uh, what the U.S. was saying in Vietnam at the beginning. They have advisors there, and they have other. You know, mm-hmm. but like, there's only so many mercenaries that are I think are going to want to go and do this. And certainly, the Saudis have the money to 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 sustain it. Um, but at what cost? And also, you know, I, th- I think that Saudi, when 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 an uprising happens within Saudi Arabia, or if they start to experience uh, acts of terrorism aimed at the royal family, uh, you know, once there was a guy who had a bomb inside of his his ass, 
who very nearly blew up uh, the intelligence chief of Saudi Arabia. And this was just, you know, a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that that's going to call the question on sort of what Saudi is doing. I, it, you know, there's no way of having like an independent poll of Saudis and what they think of this. Um, you definitely have a, a, a troll army online uh, that, you know, they go after yeah, people. Yeah, the moment you say something, a guy named right. like Lion will go, <laughs> right. will go right. this is an internal affair. Fuck you. Well, like when the, well, when the yeah. king, when the, when the king croaked, you know, I was just like pissing all over his grave yeah. like, immediately. And I like out of the woodwork, all of these, like it was like the troll factory that everybody thinks is just Julian Assange and Putin. Like, <laughs> Came out of yeah. the woodwork. One, one, one closing thought, though, on this whole bipartisan nature of the of, of the empire and love of war and all those things um, is is you know when when Kissinger finally fucking croaks, then you're going to see the disgusting uh, nature of the sameness. Of oh, these my oh, I mean, just, oh my god! Oh my god! Yeah. Imagine you know, like if I was an actor and and, I, and someone told me that I had to cry, I would I would think of like watching MSNBC after Kissinger's death. <laughs> Oh, my God. oh, so crazy! Don't do it. Oh, oh no, but it's, but it's gonna be—it's gonna be this like complete. The word, the word revision. statesman is gonna be oh, stretched shit. to its absolute oh. limit. But it's but that but that's that's the point of all of this. It's it's like like Hillary's appeal in the last debate to like the Republicans and independents to join with her. It's it's the same sick kind of thing that you're describing, where it's like. Uh, after 9-11, we better all get together and sign this blank check for George Bush and, you know, Barbara Lee. Oh, she's a fucking crazy person. And it's she's actually the only person that was right about all of this stuff. And like she got death threats for standing up and opposing the authorization for the use of military force. Same thing is true in these butchers that that should whose lives should be examined as like war criminals. It's like he's going to get a fucking state funeral mm-hmm. and it's going to be a love fest. And the Republicans should come and join Hillary. They want to, man, with the exception of some stuff involving, you know, domestic policy and in some circles, women's right to choose, which is a very, very fucking serious issue if Trump becomes president. Most of these people are going to support Hillary because she represents their values. It's not like, oh, Max Boot has to hold his nose and, you know, vote (laughs) for Hillary. It's like, no, Hillary is your fucking kind of person, man. It's like, you know, having other people's kids fight their wars, you know. It's, uh, I mean, the... I lost the spit it the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> Fucked up. I should have had two cups of coffee. Uh, or some liquor. Something. Yeah. I should have had ketamine. They should uh lay, they should do the bonfire with him at Bohemian yeah, yeah. Grove. His yeah. his big bloated corpse <laughs> yeah. set on fire at the Bohemian Grove. But yeah. also can you our election we have Alex Jones, Julian Assange, Putin. It's like amazing. Oh, did you see that uh, did you see Sean Hannity the other day where he was like WikiLeaks Free is great. Yeah. Free Julian Assange. I can't wait till Sean Hannity is posting his PGP key on the show. <laughs> what is this? this is a great year, by Everybody the way. Everybody should use a Tor browser. Yeah. Sean yeah. Hannity. Yeah. Uh, th- you can only access Hannah date <laughs> on tour. <laughs> uh, talk to me on signal, Sean. <laughs> All right. Uh, last question. Any chance for dirty wars part two rise of McRaven? <laughs> <laughs> wow. That is, uh, that's an interesting question. No, I don't think there will be a dirty wars part two. Really? Cause um, I have a screenplay. Oh, you it's, it's, okay. it's about, you know, it's about a rogue journalist who plays by his own rules, who uncovers a, a, a giant conspiracy. That that is so like I don't think there's been twenty movies about that. In the past, <laughs> I, like, I have you know, I have a prequel. I have a prequel in mind. A right, prequel I would do. Okay, so the journalist works for. Uh, unfortunately, now defunct site. It was called HotSoup.com. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he, he does a cyber town hall with Bill McRaven. No, I'm, I'm thinking like you need like like sort of a, you know a Rust Cole character. Yeah, he's yeah. assembling like a giant pushpin collage in like a, a, a shipping container. And then like you're putting you're putting push pins onto a map and then like you step back and it's like the usual suspects and you realize that all the pins on the map form the baseball crank face yeah. <laughs> and you're like, my God. But what, what if I did what if I did something like um, like not Dirty Wars where I just went and embedded with like Max Boot? And uh, <laughs> his normal life, yeah. and, like, rep- but reported on it as though it was like an amazing investigation, yeah. like, you know. And every morning, Boot has to decide, do I make my own Nespresso or do I go and order coffee from that cute barista at Starbucks? I mean, Think about Max. I guess I can say it now. I used to work with a guy at Live Right. We published his book. Max and, Boot? Oh, yeah. Uh, man. Invisible Invisible Armies. Yeah. His his Reader's <laughs> Digest history of uh, counterinsurgency. It, but. Invisible <laughs> Armies is like, it, it, was, it, was it like a reference of like the fact that the Kagans and Max Boot like have never been in the army? <laughs> yeah. I know they want to. <laughs> Actually, that, actually, I, the, I didn't read the it. The introduction but. to the book 
the very first page, he talks about getting in a Humvee with the boys in Ambar province and talking about the, the Kevlar that you put over your genitals to, uh, to stop your balls from getting blown been, off. I would have been right in there if I didn't have a uh, gamer's foot. And, uh, but I, no, I, I, was, I, I gotta I was say, sitting there in a Hummer with Petraeus. <laughs> I gotta say the movie made about a documentary made about him would be the most boring fucking it would thing be imaginable. Awful. <laughs> Unless Herzog directed it. <laughs> That would rule. I was on Lou Dobbs' show with with Max Boot once. Oh, wow. It was, the was green room like? was really weird, you know? Wow. Well, Lou Dobbs came out there with his crystal white fake teeth, and he was like... <laughs> oh. <laughs> He, you know, he he smelled like Winston cigarettes, and he like, you know, sits down. And Alpha. I'm like, Max Max Boot and I are like sitting. It's almost like the Hillary Trump not shaking hands thing. Like Max Boot could not be far farther away from me. In the body. He was almost like in the bathroom of the green room, come, like nowhere near me. Um, no, but the the green room situation sometimes is really hilarious when I'm like on to debate like a terrible person. Uh, once I was also with uh, Ed Koch. He called, uh, he, called me a ter- he called me a, te- a terrorist lover or terrorist. Yeah, he said, you really love the terrorists, don't you? Um, during a break on MSNBC. Oh, my God. Anyway, so yeah, I'm going to say... Your green th- room is much better than MSNBC's, <laughs> Thank you, though. thank you. Uh, no, I'm definitely going to send you that screenplay, though. So, you know. Hey, you know, I mean, you you know, you know, can get an agent for that shit. <laughs> yeah. try- no, it sounds really, uh, really viable. His I book- will say this, though, in terms of green room uh, gossip. Yeah. Yeah. The worst book... I think the worst book party, just in terms of how awful the spread was, was Max Boot's book party at the Council on Foreign Relations, which I thought was going to be awesome. I was like, oh, this God, I can't <laughs> believe I had to publish this. At least I'll get a swanky party. What was it? It was just like... Like a Costco place? It was like, yeah, like crudite and like stale focaccia bread and then like some like beers just in a cooler and then red and white wine. That's it. That's oh, like, man. dude, that's like when I went to John Kasich's second place victory party in New Hampshire. <laughs> and he seriously, he seriously had like, it was a plastic tray of two types of crackers, cheese, ranch dressing, and pineapples. <laughs> like that was it. Still better than when Rubio threw a pancake breakfast with no pancakes. God, dude, New Hampshire was like, that was like my Vietnam. <laughs> so many fucking catering fuck ups. That was... I thought you were gonna say that Max Boot had like military rations there, like, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody we we've closed out all the bathrooms. You have to dig a hole for your own latrine. <laughs> Maggots. No. And this that would be cool if you could give Max Boot a blanket party, like in Full Metal Jacket. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> Ow! <laughs> um, no, yeah, like it was at the Council on Foreign Relations, which has this enormous townhouse. Not even a townhouse; it's bigger than that in like the East Fifties or whatever. It's like eyes wide shut or something. But like, but like, the no one's in masks. Yeah, 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 but like, nobody's in masks, and they have like a really shitty hors d'oeuvres spread. That's that's what <laughs> being in the Council on Foreign Relations is like. And no one's fucking. Yeah, no one's fucking. Not yeah, not at all. And like, <laughs> instead of that weird uh, chanting played backwards, it's just elevator music played backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, thanks so much for coming, man. It was great talking to you. It was great to be in the trap house. <laughs> Please come back. Hell yeah. Thanks a lot, man. Can I come back when Kissinger dies? Hell oh yeah. Oh my God. Fuck yeah. yeah. Or Dick Fuck Cheney. Yeah. We could do it. We're going to have a fucking Mexican hat party on his fucking <laughs> like, bloated shit, corpse. Yes. But while the out-of-touch politicians slept, a powerful new ideology was beginning to form. One in which irony was good, where family court was bad, and whose leaders promised triple-digit orgasms and a renewable... <laughs> 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 <laughs>